must say it's such a, a joy to actually see so many new faces and uh, I think this is just an amazing opportunity to really network, find out what other people are doing. If you, if you actually haven't um, introduced yourself to somebody that you don't recognize, do so because um, that's where you can learn a lot about what people are doing, what mistakes they've made and I'm going to get a little bit into that. This talk is going to be quite personal. Um, and I'm hoping through the talk that people won't make the same or similar mistakes that I did when I did my thesis. And, um, and believe me, I made many. <laughs> um, I currently work for an organization called Shark Spotters. I'm based in Cape Town, for those of you that don't know me. I've been working on white sharks for almost 10 years now. I started on a cage diving vessel and I got experience through um, through working with operators and commercial operators and identifying gaps uh, that uh, were existing at the time. Uh, a lot has happened in 10 years um, and I'm going to take you through that journey a little bit and, uh, and try and show you some of the pitfalls that I fell into and that many of my fellow students sitting here fell into as well. Um, and then also through um, our supervisors, there's supervisors here, people that have couple of students that they've seen through um, and fall into those pitfalls and they can tell you there are common themes throughout and common mistakes that people are making um, again and again and with just a little bit of homework you can try and limit those uh, issues, make life a little bit easier on yourself because um, although I said surviving a shark thesis, it is barely, I'm kind of barely coming through it um, and uh, and it has been a, a very long and hard process. Um, so this little graphic just that was just kind of, you know, this is going to be quite light-hearted and um, I really hope that you'll come and chat to me afterwards as well if you have got any problems or, or questions. Um, Shark Spotters has become quite a kind of a, a popular culture thing in Cape Town and, uh, and this is one of the, the cartoonist versions of, of our symposium, if we had to have a shark spot a symposium, so there you go. <laughs> uh, so just to set the stage, I think that we really are at a crucial time in shark research and shark conservation. And conserving sharks has become and is a current global conservation issue. Um, increasingly, we know that shark populations uh, are vulnerable. Sharks are vulnerable due to their life history strategies. Um, overfishing is rampant. It's one of the major issues face facing our oceans at the moment. The demand for sharks is increasing, sharks and rays is increasing. And significant declines in populations are being reported from all over the world now with the latest publication actually showing that for most species, the exploitation rate is higher than the rebound rate. So we are sitting with some major issues that we need to tackle. And of course, the problem comes in that sharks have vital roles in ecosystems. The removal of sharks can have ecosystem impacts, and thus there is this important uh, need to conserve sharks. So in South Africa, um, we face a situation where sharks are increasingly being exploited, certainly not on um, some of the levels uh, in, uh, in the European areas and so forth, but it's estimated that our annual uh, catch rate is about 3,500 tons of sharks. Um, so, so we are contributing to um, the, the industry. Um, it's recognized globally that a lack of scientific information is hindering effective conservation and management strategies. And this, this is where we come in as scientists and young scientists and scientists that have been in this field in that we need to start generating more and more information that can actually help the situation and improve management and conservation be applied. Um, and recently South Africa has published its National Plan of Action for Sharks you haven't read that document, it's really, it's, it's, it's got so much information on the historical background, the current fisheries that exist for sharks and rays in South Africa, and information gaps, one of the key things I'm going to be talking about, highlighting what is needed to ensure sustainable shark populations in South Africa. And this is really where I see new research coming in, students coming in and taking advantage of those gaps in knowledge that we currently have. 
as uh, people that spend a lot of time in the field, scientists often see these kind of effects that I was just talking about firsthand. These are all pictures taken locally, just illustrating the very diverse impact that we are having on our sharks. So the fishing taking place, um, these are all in and around Cape Town area. Um, jaws and uh, uh, for sale in local markets. Um, fisheries taking place on our coasts, just outside our waters. We've got long lining, we've got trawling. So we've got all of these issues, fishing issues on our doorstep. Um, and, and seeing those firsthand, we're often in a position to identify needs and identify where um, we can assist in um, uh, improving the situation. Not only that, South Africa is probably one of the most um, opportunistic areas to do shark research. We've got one of the world's most diverse shark and ray faunas. We've got 181 species, which, which represents 15% of the world's known shark and ray species. 34% or 34 species, 24% are endemic to South Africa, as Jeremy mentioned this morning. Um, and so there's massive potential for shark um, and ray projects to get started. Um, and on top of this, it's accessible. Most of these, a lot of these are right on our doorstep. You know, we can go into False Bay, for example, um, we can see uh, various species of endemic cat sharks. Off Cape Point, we've got blues and makos. Um, so there really is a lot of uh, diverse opportunities and accessible opportunities for students. So even though we have these diverse fauna and accessible sharks, um, we have got an issue with shark projects where up to 75% of shark theses that are started are either not completed in the time frames of the universities uh, or funding cycles or not completed at all. So there's this huge issue coming in with shark theses. Um, and this was just a very rough estimate I did of uh, some of the main institutions where students are busy conducting research. And I kind of, I looked at this picture and I thought this looks like a, like a, a mine, like a time bomb. <laughs> when in fact it's, it's just a boy that's marking some of the bull shark research in the Breda River. But I kind of look at the thesis and in my own experience and through friends of mine, this time bomb, this thesis becomes this um, there's almost an obstacle that cannot be um, uh, uh, succeeded at. And uh, I've seen many of my friends drop out of science um, or even when they have completed their thesis, you know, really just totally um, uh, ro rose glasses have been taken off and they have left the field. So um, what is the issue and um, where can we kind of start improving that and getting more students successfully completing their theses and successfully completing them in time. So just to go back a little bit and tell you about my PhD for, for those of you that don't know and even those of you that do know me probably don't have all the details but um, it really was a dream come true for me to start researching uh, great white sharks. I've always wanted to be a marine biologist like I'm sure many of you growing up and um, I started doing my uh, undergraduate research in 1996. I completed that in 1998. I then decided that I didn't know what I wanted to do. I didn't know if I wanted to continue with the, the research. I didn't really enjoy the university experience that much. Um, I felt that it wasn't covering the things that I wanted to learn and so I actually left the, the university world and I started to volunteer on a cage diving boat and then subsequently also worked um, in, the, in the game uh, industry. But throughout that time working on the cage diving boat, it really gave me valuable insight into what other opportunities were out there. Things that they don't teach you in undergrad, things that they don't teach you in universities. And um, I recognized that there was a lot of gaps in our knowledge on white sharks at the time. This has improved over the last 10 years, and now other gaps are existing. Um, I came back to UCT in 2002, where I completed my honors, and I successfully completed a shark project in my honors year because I used an existing database. Somebody else had really started collecting data. I helped supplement that during my volunteering process on the cage diving boat, and then we put together a nice um, honors thesis. 
a colleague of mine that was doing her honors thesis at the time had a sample size of one. So her project was not as successful because she started collecting, trying to do a field research project um, as an honors project. You're kind of setting yourself up for failure, um, wanting to do field studies uh, in very, very short periods of time. Went on to do a, um, start my master's in 2003. I upgraded my project, which I wish I now hadn't upgraded, because the reason I upgraded my project was because I didn't have my ducks in a row, and I kind of saw it as an extension of trying to improve that. Um, I didn't see it like that when I upgraded, <laughs> um, but essentially, I, the mistake that I made was I wanted to collect too much. I didn't have a focused and specific hypothesis, and because of that, I went out into the field and I just collected everything because there was just so much information that was needed to be collected, but I needed to have a focused hypothesis, which I didn't have. Um, and so I ended up upgrading my masters because I was able to do so with tons of data. So I gave a, a proposal to UCT and all the staff attended, and I threw out all these numbers about all this data I was collecting, and everyone was very impressed, except what I realized that the, what I realize now, what nobody else realized at the time, is that I didn't have a focused PhD project. I was really just amassing information. And that then led to this next section of 2006 to 2013, completing a PhD. So one of the reasons I have taken so long is because I simply couldn't stay focused. I didn't start off with a focused hypothesis, and I've slowly had to generate that um, and find uh, a, a very specific PhD in that. Um, on top of that, I started working in 2008. And because you are then, your, your focus gets, um, uh, you start earning money, um, people start expecting you to produce other work, and so, and that work is often much easier to do than your thesis, so you continue to do that work. Um, and the thesis gets put on the back burner, gets put on the back burner, and then just, you know, constantly um, takes so much time. So, some of the lessons that I've learned, um, I've tried to cover in this talk, and one of the big lessons that I've learned is do your homework. And I don't only mean do your homework with regards to a literature review and knowing everything about the species and you know, kind of covering the taxonomy and the biology, but use experiences like this, those elderly folk that uh, Enrico was talking about. Bombard them at these kind of events. Um, talk to Malcolm Smale, talk to other supervisors that have seen students come through and through and through, um, and get advice from them. Um, talk to other people in the industry, cage diving operators and shark tourism operators and fishermen. Find out as much information as possible and talk to other students as well because you really will be surprised um, at how little you know, even though you think at the time you know quite a bit, um, how little you really know. Um, and then it's actually already come up in Jeremy's talk and Herman's mentioned it as well, is that now you need to look for gaps knowledge gaps. When I started, white sharks was a big knowledge gap. Nobody was working on them. This has changed considerably. We've got a really strong team of people that are working on white sharks. So white sharks really, as a master's or in a, even a PhD now, I would say look for lesser known species. Um, look for uh, species that are endemic, species that might be a little bit more easier to study. Um, and then again, some of the most successful shark projects that I've seen students do over the last couple of years are where they've used existing data sets. They've taken data sets that have been worked on and collected for six years, um, and they've then been able to produce um, a, a, a fantastic thesis through that. And a very personal example is, um, some of you may not know him, but Adrian Hewitt is currently registered at UCT for a master's thesis. And he started off with a proposal to look at reproduction in white sharks. And he, he really did some really good things. He had a fantastic proposal. It, it was a gap in our knowledge. But we all underestimated how difficult it would be to collect samples. And so two years later, Adrian did not have a PhD. and did not have enough data for his masters. And so he ended up having a plan B. 
and his plan B was to use my existing photo ID database to produce a population estimate. And he's now really starting to produce a fantastic masters, and he's going to do a PhD on the reproductive stuff. Um, similarly, in terms of collecting, people doing collections um, where they need samples, genetic samples, stable isotope samples, um, look at the availability and accessibility of samples because sometimes you might think that they are easy to obtain, but that is not always the case. So have a plan B. And just always remember that for a master's and for a PhD, you do have limited time. So you have to try and stay focused as much as possible. Another very important consideration which is often overlooked is the relationship between a student and a supervisor. And one of the limitations in South Africa is that we actually don't have a big base of experienced senior shark scientists that can actually accommodate students because of limited resources and limited funding. Um, so there is a limitation in the, in the number of supervisors that you can actually approach. Um, and this relationship is probably going to be more, in, uh, more important than a lot of um, casual boyfriend and girlfriend relationships over your life. It is a crucial relationship. Um, and it has to be a good fit. So if your project is on behavior, then it's not, you know, you need to find a supervisor that also has experience and is publishing and is active in that field, not necessarily just somebody that knows sharks. And so, you really have to get a good fit for your supervisor. Um, and then it's a two-way street. So you have to communicate with your supervisor. Um, and I was fortunate in that I had supervisors, Dr. Lena Compagno and Charlie Griffiths, that did give me a lot of leeway in terms of um, finding my feet, letting me do the project that I wanted to do. Um, so, and I had that support, but as a team, we did not have that focus to get a master's and a PhD in that adequate time frame. So we, we all three of us fell into this, uh, these pitfalls in terms of limiting time for a, um, for a PhD, even though there were two students at UCT who had not completed a, a thesis on my chart. So they actually had started um, and they fell into the trap of not being able to collect enough samples, not being able to get into the field enough, and um, and not having enough resources. And then the project just stopped. Um, so, you know, those kind of things, recognize that those things are quite, um, quite prevalent. And then in terms of, of supervisors, I get a lot of emails from students wanting to do shark theses and shark projects, probably once, once a week. Um, and, uh, and some of the common things, people send an email and it's like, hey, how are you? I, I got your email and I heard you did this project. I kind of read this and there's spelling mistakes and it's like, you know, there's like no capital letters and immediately it's just like archive or delete because if you can't even decently write an email to a, pretend, a potential supervisor or a potential collaborator, um, then, then you really, that's, that's not a good start. Um, so, and then often supervisors are really busy. They have a job and they've got other students and they get all these queries. And so if you don't hear back from somebody, Send them a, a reminder email, you know, have a, have a very well thought out um, idea, do your homework in what you want to do, um, have a, a concept that they can think about. Um, if you don't hear from them, then send them a reminder. And there's this very fine line between being persistent, which is a good thing, and harassing people, which is a bad thing. So <laughs> try and find that, uh, that balance. And then resources and funding, I mean, this. This come, comes into play with everything. So from getting the appropriate supervisors, supervisors can only support uh, a limited number of students. They only have resources available for a few people. Um, and uh, in South Africa in particular, with our WE grant, we do have limiting funding opportunities. There are some, but you have to work very, very hard for them. And you have to recognize that you, you, you have to be quite creative in many cases. So just some of those, NRA is still a fantastic um, uh, uh, way to get a grant, usually a scholarship to cover your living costs. I know many students that have got NRF grants, so definitely go for those, either through a supervisor or on your own. Um, 
Academic institution, uh, institutions often have smaller grants available for project costs and for um, living, living costs. So really do your homework and go and look into those um, opportunities. Private grants. I only recognized sort of the last two or three years that there are a lot of grant opportunities. They might not all be South African based. And in fact, for example, the Ruford grant um, is a grant specifically for small projects in developing countries. And South Africans are increasingly going for those grants um, and getting those. So look out and do your homework in the number and um, accessibility of grants. And then also government is really, the, when I started, I would not have been able to start my project without the support of MCM at the time, DEA as it is now. Um, and that was through national government funding and support. Um, but more recently, I would not have a job if it wasn't for municipal support. So government is a really good source of, uh, of funding. It is limited, so you do have to work hard for it. You do have to have an, a novel and, and much needed project, and you do have to fight for it. But they are there. Uh, with the accessibility of sharks, we have um, this, this wonderful diversity, but we also have this wonderful coastline that is very harsh. And time and time again, people doing field studies are uh, kind of quite um, uh, go off the side of the cliff when it comes to not collecting enough data because of bad weather days, the sharks not being present when they're supposed to be. Um, not, not enough time to sample, and I had a very, very personal experience with this where when I started the project together with my research partner at the time, Carl LaRoche, um, we decided that we wanted to put this camera system on Seal Island so that we could uh, monitor the predations taking place around Seal Island. This system cost almost 100,000 Rand. We worked very hard to get that funding, and uh, it made a really nice seal bed. <laughs> um, and, you know, this was something that put all our data collection into, uh, we really were, were planning on using this to supplement our data collection and have 24 sort of daylight hours of observation and all our statistical tests were based on this. And when this happened, it really put a spanner in the works and we lost a lot of opportunity we lost a lot of um, uh, opportunity for uh, staying in the field um, and then we also uh, needed to go back to the drawing board and have a plan b and uh, and collect the data some other way this kind of uh, um, example is not unique to my project as many people in this audience will know um, and uh, for example dr malcolm smale they started this massive big tiger shark project and they had acoustic receivers out, and a big storm came along and washed the receivers away. Um, many people using acoustic receivers or uh, equipment in the ocean will have these kinds of stories. So be aware of this. Um, know that your days at sea uh, are limiting, and, um, and again, have a plan B. So if the weather doesn't get you, the sharks are definitely going to sabotage your project, without a doubt. Um, and this is an example of a white shark hanging onto the motor of my boat. And right, this was the second day of sampling. We had got everything together. Um, we had uh, Stefan Swanson on board. He was going to teach us how to tag great whites. And uh, we got out there. Everything's in place. And within about an hour, this shark decided to latch onto the motor, pull it side to side, and break my steering of my boat. So another two weeks later, I had no more field work because I was stuck at home. Um, so they will definitely try and sabotage your project. The bull shark work, for example, Megan McCord and her team from SAS will tell you that when the sharks are biting and you're in Cape Town, um, they, the fishermen are talking about losing their grunter and their bait, and they're sending pictures of you know these sharks that have been very active over the last couple of days and Meg will pack the car and get everything ready and drive up to the breeder and get there and then the shot on it. So these kind of things are very, very um, uh, prevalent in field studies and you need to be prepared for them um, and, uh, and you need to recognize that this thing takes up a lot of time. 
Um, this should have been here last week. It's just, you know, when you want to do field work and, uh, and you're sitting there waiting for sharks, waiting to collect samples, uh, somebody's going to tell you you should have been here last week. Um, so get used to that first. Uh, there's a lot of rewarding uh, work with shark projects. And um, I've, these are just some of the, the photos and the people that I've worked with over the years. And this is probably some of the most memorable and special moments in my life. You know, so a thesis is not just about completing a thesis. This becomes part of your journey and your career and your life. Um, and you meet people and you work with people and you do things that you, know, you really treasure forever. But this is kind of the, the pretty picture of research. This is the fun stuff. This is the stuff that you do get into this field um, for. But you have to recognize that you're going to be fighting with your computer for probably more time than you're spending in the field. Um, and you really have to have good time management. Again, I didn't have good time management. I spent most of my time in the field. Um, I was collecting as much as I possibly could. I was enjoying all the new things I was doing, and I didn't stay focused. And, um, I, and that meant, actually, that I ended up spending a lot more time than I had needed to behind my computer in the last couple of years. Um, so really, your time management is crucial. Another issue that um, I would change if I had to go back, you know, we could all go back and change things, is I would look at my data management systems. I would do my homework and how other people had collected and stored the data before me. Um, and then I would also be quite religious in entering that data and not letting it pile up for a couple of days or a couple of weeks and then trying to enter it. Because not only does it become a really big issue and a hassle for you to do that, but you realize that on that day, oh, somebody didn't fill in the number of hours we were at sea, and then you've lost that data. So be meticulous in your data collection and the data storage techniques. Expect curveballs. So when I started, <laughs> nobody told me that I'd be dealing with shark attacks. I didn't get into this field to deal with shark attacks. I got into this field because I recognized that we knew very little about this apex predator in our waters. And I will never forget the night that this changed. And I was sitting in a pub in Fishhook. You probably all know it, there's Which only the one. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and somebody overheard myself and Carl Rush talking about our day at sea. And we'd had a really great day at sea, we'd sampled sharks and we were counting the seals. And someone said, did you hear about the shark attack? And we were like, the what? The shark attack that happened today. And it was the fatal attack at Millis Point on a spear fisherman. That is when things changed for me because it was the second fatal attack in two years. And people start to get really upset about the situation in Cape Town. And they wanted answers. And the only person doing any work on white sharks in Cape Town was this really young career student. And so I was thrown completely into the deep end. Um, and that's possibly also why I've, I've taken a little bit more time with my thesis. In the, uh, this really was an example of how your research, um, at the time you might not recognize how important it is. And whether it's white sharks, or whether it's working on management issues, whether it's bull sharks, whether it's cat sharks, um, you just never know how important your research can be. Um, and you need, to be, um, you need to be aware of that, you need to be prepared for in whatever form they come um, and so you need to be flexible but never forget your original plan and your original intention. Another issue that um, I think many of us face and it's often really quite difficult to talk about when it comes to conservation, when it comes to management, when it comes to topical issues whether it's sharks or baboons or you know something else that is very topical people care a lot about, there's a lot of emotion about it People talk about human-wildlife conflict, but in actual fact, it is people-people conflict. And a lot of students, and I'll give you an example of, um, of uh, 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 an issue recently that happened where Megan McCord and her team have been lobbying for increased protections for bull sharks in the Breda River because subsequent to the research that has taken place there, 
a certain amount of uh, people are very negative about the sharks in the Breda River. It's these polling and opposing views on sharks, and they've been lobbying um, to get increased protections because people were going out and um, fishing them and killing them um, in, in, a, in a space where we don't really know very much about those sharks in the river, uh, Breda River. And recently, they successfully managed to get improved protections. And while a lot of people were really happy about this, there were many people that weren't. And um, Meg got not only a professional complaint against what she had proposed, um, and a formal complaint to government, but she also got personally attacked. Um, and these kind of things uh, happened uh, recently with uh, Ryan Johnson as well, where a fisherman was successfully prosecuted for catching a white shark. And while a lot of people were really happy with the outcome, many people weren't. And he was not only personally attacked, but attacked in the media and tried to be attacked uh, personally as well. Um, so when it comes to uh, shark projects, you are going to deal with people. And whether you're dealing with uh, fishermen or shark operators or just members of the public, um, you need to recognize that um, you have to be quite proactive in how you, you deal with the situation. Um, and people, and you don't, nobody teaches you that at university. Nobody actually ever talks about uh, dealing with people when it comes to uh, taking on conservation projects. And what I actually wanted to read a little bit about is some of these personal attacks in my own experience. Um, <laughs> I've, some uh, real headlines is new shark experts needed. That's me. <laughs> um, um, then, Cult sharks with a taste for human flesh. And it is, the, it starts with the idiotic response from uh, the shark attack, so called shark working group. Um, is, you know, so, so these kind of things happen, uh, and, and you have to deal with them. Um, and what I've learned through this experience, and it's taken many years, is that people actually just want to feel heard. And a lot of people when it comes to dealing with shark operators, for example, really have got a, a, a passion for the animals that you're studying, so you share a passion. So you have to try and find that common shared passion, and it's really easier said than done. And as a shark scientist, when I started, I kind of thought, well, I'm the scientist, and you know, I, I'm going to do this, and I've got a permit, so I don't need to get your approval. And that was the totally wrong attitude to have. And you really, from, from, from the way I experienced conflict between research and commercial operators, I now recognize that I could have been more proactive and I could have established more communication. So, you know, you have to look at the bigger picture of what you're trying to achieve. And I really think if you are involved in conservation projects, you kind of have to step up and try and be the person that establishes contact and establishes um, those relationships and is approachable um, uh, in a lot of the time. And again, just recognizing that you know the people that you are working side by side with, they have different objectives, but they share a common uh, passion for the ocean. So just following on from that, be proactive and not reactive. And I'll talk a little bit more about this in the recent OSEARCH project, where we kind of had to be reactive, um, where we could have been a little bit more proactive. Um, establish the communication. You know, set up relationships with uh, journalists and recognize that kind of sitting in your bubble of shark research um, is going to be limiting. You need to widen it. You need to make it apply. You need to try and popularize what you're doing, get people on board, get people excited, because that's going to be a sustainable future for your project, and then also for projects that follow yours. Because a lot of the conflict actually comes from previous history, underlying conflict that people have between scientists and commercial operators, for example, between scientists and fishermen. So there's this baggage that comes along um, with dealing uh, with conflict. Um, so, this is my husband. <laughs> this one. <laughs> um, and the reason I kind of put this slide in there, it's a pretty cool slide, yeah, you know, <laughs> is something that I recognize now is the value and the importance of your family and your friends 
in the successful completion of your thesis. And um, I think many people put that aside again. You know, the thesis, you start the thesis and it's field work and it's writing up and your family and your friends kind of get pushed onto the sideline. Um, and so the advice that I have is to try and treat your thesis like a job. Um, so try and time manage. If I had to choose the way I did my thesis again, I would work from 8 until 5 or 8 until 6. I would have time off in the evenings and I would take a day off a week. Um, instead of trying to do 7 days a week, 24-7, um, you actually, in the long term, cannot sustain that. Um, and you then become less productive. Or well, that's my experience at least. So I would try and treat it as a job um, and recognize the, the value of that support. If I did not have the support of my husband, I would probably not be here. And I think a lot of my fellow uh, uh, students would, would agree. Their partner is key in the success. So don't undervalue that in any way. So I just wanted to talk about the OSEARCH project. And um, I do know that this has been a controversial project. And um, there's probably still a lot of misinformation out there. So I also encourage you to talk to scientists that were involved in this project because if you try and search for information on it, there's a lot of misinformation. But I wanted to use this as a case study because this project kind of had all of these elements that I've been talking about in it. First of all, it is the largest collaborative shark project in South Africa. And it really started off where Ryan Johnson was approached by Chris Fisher in Hawaii. And Ryan had a choice. And he had a choice to try and grab as much of the pie for himself as possible, or to bring uh, collaborative scientists in. And he actually chose to bring all the white shark scientists that were working in South Africa into the project, on top of trying to broaden the objectives of the project that didn't only focus on white sharks, but as Enrico mentioned, using white sharks to study other species. Um, it had creative funding. So, um, for example, I remember sitting in one of the first meetings and Malcolm saying, we've been waiting 20 years for this because this kind of research is impossible without the funding uh, that was provided through the History Channel series. And that's a whole topic on itself in terms of research marrying with um, filming and so forth. But in this case, it really provided much needed funding for much needed research. It was challenging. We had a specific plan, for example, to tag 10 white sharks in each of the aggregation areas. So 10 white sharks in False Bay, 10 in Ponds Bay, 10 in Mossel Bay, and 10 in Algoa Bay. That didn't happen. And we only tagged three in False Bay, much to my disappointment. <laughs> <laughs> and they all seem to be beelining away from False Bay for some reason. Um, but we had to deal with weather, and the scientists and the, and the fishermen on board had to deal with weather and conditions all of the time, and not only environmental, um, they also had to deal with people conflict. Um, for example, in False Bay, um, just after the research had happened in the bay, there was a fatal shark attack, and immediately the research was blamed for that attack. And it had a huge toll on how the project um, the future of the project and how it actually went forward and the need for it to adapt. Um, and uh, it also brought in that personal conflict, the personal attacks on the scientists involved and dealing through those issues. And again, these are not things that they teach you in university um, or in your, in your academic institution. Um, and it really comes down to recognizing and identifying these kind of uh, challenges and being adaptive. And then one of the massive lessons I learned was the importance of communication to the public um, and to stakeholders in, the, um, in your science. Really try and, and bring them in and be that proactive person, as I've said. And, and I keep repeating that because it's just so important to be proactive. Don't sit back and wait for um, uh, people to come to you. Really go out. It's your project. You're starting it. You're the driver of your project. Um, and so the importance of communication, because in the lack of communication, there's a gap for misinformation. And so you then end up potentially being in a worst case scenario if you just didn't put, you know, kind of be proactive in that, that um, uh, example. Subsequently, after this actually happened, 
um, I was too late in being proactive for this, but afterwards I tried to kind of build those bridges. And so I took the time and I probably took out about 20 business owners slash politicians for coffee. And I picked up the phone, I sent an email, I'm like, hi, would you like some more information on the Osearch project? And they were like, yes. And everyone said yes. And I was really being, I, when I got into the meeting before and I'd sit there and I'd go, I'm gonna be attacked and people, and it didn't happen in a single time. People actually wanted to have, they knew that there was a lot of misinformation happening and they wanted the information. And once they actually found out the facts, um, it really uh, started to build those bridges that had been broken um, down the line. And then this project has provided opportunities for shark research for the next 10 years at least. And on Wednesday, we actually have a, a, a meeting with the collaborating scientists planning the papers and just on a rough count we've got 20-25 papers that have come from this single project and I see room for, for students and in fact at least two students will do their PhD on this work, uh, there's other students doing their masters, um, so these kind of opportunities um, you really do need to, to take advantage of when they come your way. And then just kind of to start ending off, I know I've probably gone way over my a lot of time period, but future prospects. When I started, there were very, very few prospects. And although, depending on who you talk to, there is limiting opportunities, but there are opportunities, and there are definitely increasingly new opportunities. For example, this facility, Oceans Research, wasn't here a couple of years ago. And, you know, I've only recently seen it a few weeks ago for the first time widely impressed with the number of students and the setup here. And this was started by masters and PhD students. So thinking out the box, thinking creatively, uh, being passionate about what they're doing and trying to find ways to stay and do the shark research. Um, uh, 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 NGOs like SAS, for example, creating opportunities for students. So you've got all the traditional avenues, your academic institutions, your, your, your universities, government uh, positions, and there are adverts that go out um, for job vacancies um, in Department of Fisheries, in Environmental Affairs. So there are opportunities for, for researchers. The Oceanographic Research Institute, the Cuisine and Natal Sharks Board, um, there are all these different and new, quite new organizations as well that provide opportunities for students. And then also the tourism sector. The shark tourism sector has increased. It's boomed in the last couple of years. And um, I know many students that are doing internships, gaining hands-on experience, kind of trying to build their skills um, and, uh, and find, find job opportunities. And then also don't just focus in South Africa. For example, um, Kay sitting over here just got a scholarship for Australia. She applied for it, she got it. So don't just look at, uh, at uh, local, spread your wings. So just to kind of, uh, this is my second last slide. Um, to summarize, have a clear hypothesis when you're doing a thesis. Really nail that down with your supervisor. Don't try and do too much. Try and stay focused. Um, have a plan B. Really have a plan B when you're doing field work. Um, and then again, there are opportunities, but you have to have to work very hard for them. And my last slide, I'm going to say thank you at the end to, to some uh, crucial people. But be the shark in the school of sardine. There are many people, and I mean this in a positive light, not in the <laughs> shark lawyer kind of way. <laughs> um, really, you build your skills, recognize that you're going to have to work for free, probably for, <laughs> for some time. Um, I, I um, uh, spent probably about four years not earning a salary. I know colleagues of mine are in six years, they're not earning a salary, but they're kind of pushing on. They're pushing on and they're getting by. Um, so recognize that there's going to be a lot of sweat and blood kind of stakes and things that you, you, um, that you have to put in. Learn skills, do different courses, um, make yourself irresistible to hire by doing these kinds of things. Um, kind of have to make it so that people don't say no. And they look at your CV, they look at how you approach it and you go, I want you and I gra you know, grab you. Um, <laughs> and then just to, to say thank you, I was very fortunate when I started my master's. I had a, another master's student who I worked with, Carl LaRoche, and he was from Canada 
and he actually first came with the funds. So we had this fantastic marriage, uh, thanks to MCM, where they saw funds and, a, and an international student, and they saw a local student with no funds, and they kind of put us together, and it worked really well. Um, and then I was very fortunate to have Save Our Seas Foundation fund the research um, uh, after the, the first couple of years, and then my supervisors, and then right in the beginning stages in terms of logistics and funding, MCM at the time, DNL, really provided that platform. Um, so again, the guys are here, chat to them, see what opportunities are there for you. Thank you very much.